we have even more breaking news in the SEC versus Ripple case as the motions we have been waiting for answers on for almost a year have finally had orders issued. The motion to strike the fair notice defense and the motions to dismiss for Garlinghouse and Larson. We'll take a look at what just happened, but if we haven't met before, my name is Frank Cho. I'm here to help you live a richer life. On this channel, we talk about cryptocurrency, personal finance, and investing. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, do it now. That way I can keep you informed of all the latest news and updates. No market update. We'll dive right into it. This is so important. We had to literally stop the presses. I mean, literally. I was working out. I stopped the presses to come do this. So we've got some major ones here. We'll talk about the motions to dismiss first and then the motion to strike. So the individual defendants, again, Garlinghouse and Larson, are having their names brought into the case and their motions to have the claims against them uh, dismissed have been denied for both of them. What does this mean? Well, we're going to continue to see the two of them dragged through the rest of the case process. But I do want to point out one thing that could be a positive for this. Garlinghouse's attorney is Matthew Solomon. He doesn't represent Ripple or Larson. He represents Garlinghouse. So he's still going to be attached to the case, which I see that as a net benefit for us as XRP holders. We know he's the most aggressive and definitely, I feel, influential in the case as far as the uh, legal side on uh, the Ripple overall team. And so that is a good thing. At least we'll see him in the case further. Now, this was a very extensive document. This is over 30 pages where uh, Judge Torres goes through uh, Garlinghouse and Larson, what is important here, all the case citations, all of the sales of XRP, her legal analysis, everything. This is a very uh, citation heavy document. You'll see throughout uh, references to lots and lots of uh, precedents in other cases, in particular that Morrison case. And again, this is a full 31 pages where Judge Torres says, Motions to dismiss are both denied. If you want me to go through that in more detail, I need you to hit that like button. If this video gets over a thousand likes, I'll make a separate video going through this one. But it's lengthy and it will take some time to do. And I want to make sure that it's something you'll find valuable. So hit the like button. Let me know if you want to see that and comment below too. Let me know if you want to see a full breakdown and conversation around the motions to dismiss. I would probably have to do that as two videos. One for Garlinghouse, one for Larson, because that's sort of how she has it split here. And each one would be a lengthier video. Again, let me know and hit the like button if you want to see that. Now, the one that we care about probably the most is the motion to strike the fair notice defense and the motion to strike was denied. What this means is the Ripple team will be able to continue to argue the fair notice defense. This one is not as lengthy. It's about 10 pages, which is about what we normally converse through as we're looking at these rulings. So I do want to go through this one in detail because it is going to have a significant impact on the future arguments in this case and how the outcome might shape for you and I, not just for Ripple, but also for other investments we might have in the crypto space. This will set an important precedent and being able to argue this is very important for Ripple. And also when we think about the library case, they could also reference this and be able to utilize some of the arguments here as well. We'll go through it in full. Let's get right into it. So again, from Judge Torres, plaintiff, the SEC brings this action against defendant Ripple Labs and two of its senior leaders, Brad Garlinghouse and Christian A. Larson, alleging that defendants engaged in the unlawful offer and sale of securities in violation of Section 5 of the Securities Act. Ripple asserts as an affirmative defense that it lacked fair notice that its conduct was in violation of law in contravention of Ripple's due process rights. The SEC moves to strike Ripple's fair notice defense under Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 12F. For the reasons stated below, the SEC's motion is denied. Again, denied. The SEC is not able to strike Ripple's fair notice defense. Here's the background. The following facts are taken from Ripple's answer and are presumed to be true solely for the purpose of considering the motion to strike. 
Ripple was founded in 2012 as a privately held payments technology company that uses blockchain innovation to allow money to be sent around the world instantly, reliably, and more cheaply than traditional avenues of money transmission. Um, Ripple holds a large percentage of XRP, a fast, efficient, and scalable digital asset that is transacted on the cryptographic XRP ledger. XRP has a fully functional ecosystem and has utility as a bridge currency and other types of currency uses. XRP's price is not and has not been determined by Ripple's activities. Rather, the market prices XRP in correlation with other virtual currencies, including Bitcoin and Ether. Ripple has not filed a registration statement for XRP with the SEC. In February and October 2012, at Ripple's request, a legal firm provided two legal memoranda assessing the potential legal risks involved with Ripple's then proposed business plans, including risks related to banking and money transmission laws, securities laws, commodities laws, gambling laws, consumer protection laws, copyright laws, criminal laws, and tax laws. We've seen those legal memos just recently. You can refer to those videos if you want to see more detail there. Ripple has sold XRP in exchange for fiat or other currencies. To effectuate those sales, Ripple worked with third-party companies known as market makers that buy and sell XRP on Ledger and on exchanges that blind bid ask transactions or through blind bid ask transactions. At times, Ripple has included on its website a list of third-party digital asset exchanges that listed XRP. Ripple concedes that Ripple employees at times observe the trading price and volume of XRP. Ripple also admits that proceeds from Ripple's sales of XRP were used to support Ripple's operations, but maintains that its sales of XRP consistently constituted a small portion of XRP trading volume. In addition to selling XRP, Ripple has also made certain payments in XRP as a virtual currency substituting for fiat currency. Ripple claims that it has not sold XRP as an investment. XRP holders do not acquire any claim to the assets of Ripple, hold any ownership interest in Ripple, or have any entitlement to share in Ripple's future profits. Ripple did not hold an initial coin offering or ICO, offer or contract to sell future tokens as a way to raise money to build an ecosystem, or promise profits to any XRP holder. Ripple also has no relationship with the majority of XRP holders, nearly all of whom purchased XRP from third parties on the open market. Moreover, Ripple has no obligation to any counterparty to expend efforts on their behalf and does not pool proceeds of XRP sales in a common enterprise. Indeed, Ripple has its own equity shareholders who purchase shares in traditional venture capital funding rounds and who did contribute capital to fund Ripple's operations, do have a claim on its future profits and obtained their shares through a lawful and unchallenged exempt private offering. Ripple claims that if it ceased to function tomorrow, XRP would continue to survive and trade in its fully developed ecosystem. Ripple states that it has worked to develop products that utilize XRP to allow financial institutions to affect currency transfers. One of those products is on-demand liquidity, or ODL, which is intended to affect cross-border payments. Ripple asserts that it has made certain payments in XRP as a virtual currency in connection with ODL, in accordance with standard market practices in connection with new products and markets. XRP2 LLC is a wholly owned subsidiary of Ripple, registered as a money services business with FinCEN and is licensed by the New York Department of Financial Services to conduct certain virtual currency business activities. In May 2015, Ripple and XRP2 entered into a settlement agreement with the DOJ and FinCEN, which refers to XRP as a convertible virtual currency. On, Mar on May 16th, 2017, Ripple announced that it would place 55 billion XRP into an escrow on the XRP ledger and thereafter implemented the escrow of that XRP. In June 2018, the SEC's then Director of Corporate Finance stated that the SEC did not consider the virtual currencies Bitcoin or Ether uh, 
Bitcoin or Ether to be securities and that it would put aside the fundraising that accompanied the creation of Ether and look instead at the present state of Ether. Um, and in 2019, SEC staff met with a digital asset platform that was considering listing XRP. That platform sought guidance on whether the SEC considered XRP a security. During the meeting, the SEC did not say that it considered XRP to be a security. The platform then proceeded to list XRP. SEC officials has, have also stated publicly that digital assets may be considered securities under certain circumstances. Before the SEC filed the complaint in this action, XRP was listed on over 200 exchanges. Billions of dollars in XRP was bought and sold each month. Numerous market makers engaged in daily XRP transactions. Ripple's ODL product was used by many customers and XRP was used in third-party products, many of which were developed independently of Ripple. So there you have it, the full synopsis of the entire background, start to finish, as described in earlier filings with the court. The judge is just recapping, getting everyone up to speed here on the order. That's four pages of the 10. So now she'll go into the analysis of the legal precedents that she wants to cite here in making her decision and the background and standard for this legal uh, decision. So here is the analysis and starting with the legal standard. Under Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 12F, a court may strike from a pleading any, quote, insufficient defense. Motions to strike an affirmative defense are disfavored and should generally not be granted. SEC versus Thrasher, SEC or Thrasher, SEC versus Honig. In ruling on such a motion, courts deem the non-moving parties well-pleaded facts to be admitted, draw all reasonable inferences in the pleader's favor, and resolve all doubts in favor of denying the motion to strike. To succeed on a motion to strike an affirmative defense, the SEC must show that 1. There is no question of fact which might allow the defense to succeed, Two, there is no question of law which might allow the defense to succeed. And three, the plaintiff, plaintiff would be prejudiced by inclusion of the defense in cases cited here as well. With respect to the first factor, the plausibility standard of Twombly applies to determining the sufficiency of all proceeding, all pleadings, including the pleading of an affirmative defense. Therefore, the pleading party, here Ripple, must support its defenses with enough factual allegations to make them plausible. That said, courts generally apply a lower plausibility threshold when evaluating motions to strike affirmative defenses as opposed to motions to dismiss because the pleader has less time to gather facts and craft a response. As a second factor, an affirmative defense is improper and should be stricken if it is a legally insufficient basis for precluding a plaintiff from prevailing on its claims. Furthermore, in considering the third factor, courts generally look to when the defense was presented. A factually sufficient and legally valid defense should always be allowed if timely filed, even if it will prejudice a plaintiff by expanding the scope of the litigation because a defendant with such a defense is entitled to a full opportunity to assert it and have it adjudicated before a plaintiff may impose liability. So part two here, the application of this legal standard. A fundamental principle in our legal system is that laws which regulate persons or entities must give fair notice of conduct that is forbidden or required from the FCC versus Fox case. This clarity requirement is essential to the protections provided by the Due Process Clause of the Fifth Amendment and requires the invalidation of laws that are impermissibly vague. Laws fail to comport with due process when they fail to provide a person of ordinary intelligence fair notice of what is prohibited, or when they are so standardless that they authorize or encourage or encourage seriously discriminatory enforcement. But the degree of vagueness that the Constitution tolerates often depends, at least in part, on the type of law at issue. 
Courts therefore find that the that economic regulation is subject to a less strict vagueness test because its subject matter is often more narrow and because businesses which face economic demands to plan behavior carefully can be expected to consult relevant legislation in advance of action. The Supreme Court has also expressed greater tolerance of enactments with civil penalties because the consequences of imprecision are qualitatively less severe. As an affirmative defense, Ripple pleads that it lacked and the SEC failed to provide fair notice that its conduct was in violation of law in contravention to Ripple's due process rights. The SEC argues that the court should strike this defense at the pleading stage because it is a legally insufficient defense on which Ripple cannot prevail as a matter of law. The SEC also contends that it would be prejudiced by, S by Ripple's defense because the defense would lead Ripple to seek intrusive discovery. After considering the SEC's arguments, the court holds that the SEC has not met its burden of showing that Ripple's fair notice defense should be stricken at this time. Key here in this entire document, the court has considered all of the SEC's arguments, which have been numerous for striking the fair notice defense, and the court now says the SEC has not met its burden to show that the fair notice defense should be stricken. Continuing in the document here. The parties agree that Ripple is not bringing a facial challenge to the statute. Because the court is reviewing an as-applied challenge, the court shall consider the application of the challenge statute to the person challenging the statute based on the charge conduct and cases cited there. Such a consideration requires the court to evaluate whether a law can be constitutionally applied to the challenger's individual circumstances. This assessment cannot be conducted in the abstract. Rather, the court must consider whether the party claiming a lack of notice has shown that the statute in question provided insufficient notice that his or her, his or her behavior at issue was prohibited. Therefore, the court must first determine what Ripple did before assessing whether the statute fairly apprised Ripple that its constitute was prohibited. At the pleading stage, the court's examination of Ripple's conduct is limited to facts pleaded in Ripple's answer, the undisputed facts in the amended complaint, and any fact of which the court may properly take judicial notice. As discussed above, Ripple states that XRP's price bears no relation to Ripple's activities. It also asserts that it has not sold XRP as an investment and that it has no relationship with the vast majority of XRP holders. At the very least, these facts, if true, would raise legal questions as to whether Ripple had fair notice that the term investment contract covered its distribution of XRP, and the court may need to consider these questions more deeply, referring directly there to the Howey test. If the facts stated by Ripple are true, which we believe them to be, and the court has to assume them to be at this point, then there definitely has to be a more important consideration because their offers and sales of XRP do not meet the Howey test, per those statements. Continuing in the document, thus accepting all of Ripple's pleaded facts as true and drawing all reasonable inferences in Ripple's favor, as the court must do at this stage, it concludes that the SEC has not met its burden of demonstrating that there are no questions of fact or law that might allow the defense to succeed. None of the cases cited by the SEC support a contrary result. In some of these cases, the courts assessing a fair notice defense did so when ruling on a motion to dismiss, where the court was obligated to draw presumptions and inferences in favor of the SEC. Other courts analyze this issue in ruling on motions for summary judgment with the benefit of a fully developed factual record. And a couple of courts addressed facial challenges to the term investment contract 
where the court's analysis did not depend on the particular facts of the case. Moreover, the cases cited by the SEC in which courts did strike affirmative defenses at the pleading stage dealt with equitable defenses that generally cannot be brought against the SEC. And there are tons of cases cited right here in regards to each of those aspects. So note those here, but this is her providing all the backup for what she's ordering here. Continuing though, in short, the SEC has cited no case law where a court has stricken a fair notice affirmative defense at the pleading stage and the court is not persuaded that doing so is appropriate here. And this is where we can insert the fact that Jeremy Hogan made some very similar comments around this, that the pleading stage is what was going to be one of the key things here in the motion to strike. Now back to the document. Moreover, the SEC has not shown that it will suffer undue prejudice as a result of the continuation of Ripple's fair notice defense. An increase in the time, expense, and complexity of the trial may constitute sufficient prejudice to warrant granting a plaintiff's motion to strike. However, a sufficiently pleaded defense should always be allowed if timely filed, even if it will prejudice the SEC by expanding the scope of the litigation. The SEC does not contend that Ripple's affirmative defense is untimely, and the court shall not conclude at this early stage of the case that Ripple's defense is invalid. Accordingly, the SEC's motion to strike Ripple's fair notice affirmative defense is denied. Conclusion. For the foregoing reasons, the SEC's motion is denied. The court is the clerk of the court is directed to terminate the motion so ordered March 11th, 2022, Judge Torres. There you have it. This is critically important for the case. Ripple will be allowed to continue to argue their fair notice defense. As you can see, Judge Torres has highlighted here, the SEC is not arguing that this was uh, presented in an untimely fashion. Ripple set out the fair notice defense from the get-go, and they've provided everything here for the court to be able to come to this conclusion and say, no, this defense should be allowed. Again, this is at the pleading stage, and so it would be too early to strike this defense without hearing more about what is the background and what sort of uh, additional precedents can be cited and other documents and depositions that need to be cited in arguing this defense. So we will hear more on the fair notice defense. It has been allowed. That is very important for the future um, future movements in the case and potentially for action towards a settlement. Now that the SEC knows they have to fight a fair notice defense, they may not want to do that, and that could push them more towards the negotiating table. So a very important day for the case, and we have some answers that we have been waiting for for a very long time. So I hope you found this information to be helpful. If you want to see the deeper breakdown in the motions to dismiss for Garlinghouse and Larson, make sure to hit that like button. If we get over a thousand likes on this video, then I will go ahead and make separate videos going through that in further detail. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. A lot more yet to come with regard to the case as now that we're seeing this uh, fair, notice, fair notice defense being allowed, we'll see what that will yield as far as a further proceeding in the case or a possibility of settlement. Let me know your thoughts about the outcomes from today in the comments below. Thank you so much for spending some of your time here with me. I do truly appreciate it. Have a fantastic rest of your day, and I will see you in the next one.